Divine Truth Spirit Interaction Jesus, Mary and others interact with people who have lived on earth and who have now passed into the spirit world. In this recording, titled Stuart and Jesus on Celebrating Jesus' Birth, Life and Death, Mary channels Stuart, who continues a series of interviews with Jesus about Jesus and Mary's life this time questioning Jesus about societal perceptions and his emotions surrounding the celebration of his first century birth, life and death, and the 21st century false beliefs about Jesus' nature and character. Recorded on the 21st of November, 2018, from 11.30am in Wilkesdale, Queensland, Australia. Session 2 Hello everyone, how are you today? Mary and I are here again today. Uh, we've decided to do a bit more channeling. It's uh, This time it's going to be Stuart. Uh, Mary's going to be channeling Stuart asking me questions, not the other way around, so it's a bit different. And uh, and and he can introduce the topic for the, for the day when he does that. And uh, and I'll, I'll, I'm actually uh, the one in the hot seat today, so, <laughs> so we'll see how we go. Um, Mary's finding it a bit difficult today because she's being attacked quite a lot by some spirits who are trying to stop her channeling. So um, we'll see how um, it goes today, but we've, well, I'm pretty sure we'll be fine for at least a few hours anyway. <laughs> thanks, That's, um, yeah, thanks for doing it today. Yeah. It's, it's my pleasure, really. Yeah. All right, we'll just uh, get ourselves settled and get into the conversation. Well, hello, dear friend. <laughs> G'day, how are you, Stuart? I would say I'm on top of the world. But <laughs> <laughs> well, I suppose literally and figuratively, that's yeah. probably true. <laughs> yes, uh, thank you for having me today. Yeah, yeah. The topic that I, would, that I would like to discuss with you is your thoughts, your emotions and your comments about the way that you have been remembered and commemorated and oft times celebrated on earth, not just today, but throughout history. Mm. 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 Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so do you have any comments to begin with? Um. Yeah, as any spirit who's been around me for a, no, a while in the spirit world knows. <laughs> um, obviously, at specific times of the year, Easter and Christmas in particular, uh, they know that I've generally retired <laughs> to my home in the celestial heavens um, rather than be around the earth at those times of the year. And the main reason why is I just feel that a lot of like a lot, a lot of this problem of the belief about myself being God rather than just another human is particularly problematic, and and I and I feel perhaps that where is where we need to discuss to start the discussion, perhaps because it, it, there's a lot of facets to that problem. Uh, in reality, it feels to me um, that are to do not only with the general opinions of people, but also to do with their underlying sort of desires uh, in terms of trying to turn a man into a god. And also um, a, lot, a lot of problems associated with that uh, psychologically and emotionally that people face as a result, as well as the religious problems that are associated with that particular teaching. And even the general impression that people have now when we come back to earth, when we say that we're Jesus, when I say that I'm Jesus, has a and how that's interpreted is very much affected by all of these historical facts associated with how people see my identity and my life. So, mm, yeah. so perhaps I could say that there was three main uh, themes or topics that I would like to discuss with you, and mm. and it is interesting. I suppose this question has arisen because I am observing. You're coming up to the Christmas period, and I am observing a lot of hubbub mm -hmm. <laughs> about yourself. Uh, and so, yes, it's something that I've been interested in for quite some time. 
So the three major areas were, as you say, the beliefs about you as God and how that impacts upon the way that you are celebrated or commemorated or discussed or viewed. The second is about, well, really, as you know, here in the spirit life, in the higher realms, you are quite celebrated. <laughs> <laughs> and this is very fitting we feel. <laughs> In fact, I, everyone feels it's fitting to celebrate that person who has, who has shown so much and given so much. So I, I would like to discuss the, um, the properness of celebrating someone who has taught and demonstrate, demonstrated a lot, yourself in this case. And the third is really how you yourself would prefer to be <laughs> <laughs> celebrated, discussed and commemorated. Mm -hmm. So the first is relating to the beliefs about God and your y using you as a, a, as a figurehead, a figurehead for God. <laughs> yes. Yes. Uh, the second is about the rightness, the righteousness of celebrating a leader and how that can be done lovingly. And the third is your own personal emotions about this matter. Because I observe there are still some, some areas where you are much aligned with God's opinion, but others where you are quite opposed. Mm. And, and it'd be good to probably discuss mm. both those things, wouldn't it? Yes. So let us start with <laughs> how the belief about you being God affects the way that you are celebrated and commemorated. And the, I suppose there's no need to go into the, the fact that you are not God. <laughs> <laughs> and it, Although uh, I feel that it's probably a large need to go into that fact uh, many times over again, I feel. Yes, well, and perhaps um, something that interests me a lot is the, is the desire within people to view you as God. And then there is the other matter where many people in their hearts, they, they don't actually see you as God, even though they may worship or may attend or places where you are viewed as God. Yes, that's interesting in itself, isn't it? It is. Mm. So let us start with the first, mm -hmm. the problems of uh, viewing you as God. Well, I suppose you could define the problems in a number of different areas, couldn't you? Firstly, you could say any person who believes that Jesus is God, uh, firstly, is going to face some personal problems uh, regarding their, sort, their emotions and their beliefs. Um, then on top of that, there are general problems associated with collective, hu human collective belief systems. Um, and when I refer to the first one, the, the first set of belief systems, there's a lot in there about the truth about equality and the truth about worth and the truth about these mm. kind of matters, which are, which are all perceptions that a person has of oneself that is affected by the belief. And then on the second side of things, which is the general problems with it, uh, associating a human to be God uh, and what that, you know, what kind of problems that uh, are associated with that set of beliefs. And then there's also uh, what it says about God and the, and the general perceptions that people have of God as well, because there's a whole heap of things that it does to, mm. uh, and in the way that it damages a person's relationship specifically with God Yes. in terms of their perception of God and how they see God and what kind of interaction they finish up having with God. Yes. And, and their, their, des their desires, what they want from God. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. So um, I don't know how you'd like to proceed with that, but maybe we could t discuss those particular three points one at a time maybe. Uh, yes. And perhaps if we start with the last one first, because I just feel it is the most important. Yes. Uh, the, the perception of God. By turning God into a human, or at least a part human, you know, which is generally the Christian 
belief that I, you know, am part of a triune God or a part of a trinity. And these kind of belief systems have a significant effect on how a person perceives uh, how far God is away from them. Mm -hmm. And basically, most what I see people doing on earth a lot with their beliefs about myself is they sort of see me as the human part of God and therefore somebody that they can sort of connect to emotionally, uh, not understanding that actually God is, is far more, you're far more able to connect to God emotionally than you are with me emotionally. And they don't sort of perceive God's nature to be open and uh, accepting of relationship. And so, and so I see that's a big problem. Could you explain how God is more open than yourself? Well, well, God's an infinite being, firstly, uh, as, as we know. So the fact that God is an infinite being, God has an infinite amount of emotion, and God can also accept an infinite amount of emotion from all of his creation, including, of course, his highest creation, the human creation. So I am a limited being, a very limited being, in comparison to God. Uh, even though, um, you know, when, when we attain the atonement condition, we're at one with God in the way we see things, the way we view things, we're still an individual on our own right uh, who is a limited, uh, very limited in comparison to the infinite. So, so you could say if you compare even someone who's quite powerful to an infinite being, it's like they're an ant still in mm -hmm. comparison to the infinite being. And an ant is probably being uh, generous, you know mm -hmm. what I mean, because of, the infinite being is, is, is beyond, is still beyond the wildest conceptions of humankind, really. And, and so what I sort of see happening here is that, is that they don't understand that an infinite being has an infinite ability to share of themselves and to also uh, accept the sharing of his creations. And, and I, personally, as a human, have a very limited ability to accept emotion from others as well as transmit emotion of others compared to God. So, so by, by putting all this attention on a human, myself, and not putting the attention on God, basically what they're doing is limiting their ability to understand what God's real nature and, and, as, and, and feelings are for them. And, and my feelings are a very limited subset of God's feelings and so so that you don't get to experience the real feelings with with God when you're projecting all the feelings that are human that you're using almost as a substitute for for God it's interesting isn't it the way that um, people feel more comfortable or many people I observe feel more comfortable with you because they can have the the feeling or the perception that you're more a brother than a parent. And when it comes to a connection with God, uh, they often feel that this brotherly connection is easier than a parental a feeling of connection with a parent. Yes, and it's quite obvious why that yes. would be the problem, yes. isn't it? You, you know from your own personal experience uh, how much that parental relationship in your foundling, you know, in your foundation years on earth have a huge impact upon how you see God. So yes. obviously that's being carried over here a lot into, into the relationship with God. It's interesting too, I find that other religious faiths other than Christianity have a similar viewpoint towards uh, spirits. For instance, the Buddhists with Buddha and um, the uh, is Islamic faith with Allah who are actually spirits that they are projecting uh, their feelings towards. Although, again, it's a very similar dynamic that, that Christians have with me in the sense that many of them actually believe that Allah is the name of God, when actually Allah, for example, is the name of a spirit. But, but when you have feelings about God, God feels those feelings. <laughs> and it's when you project specifically at Allah the spirit that Allah the spirit receives those projections now. And it's the same with Buddha in, in a lot of ways. Some people would, you know, the Buddhist faith obviously doesn't, in its pr pristine form, doesn't uh, really have a true connection of God in the sense of a, being a, a being, a, an entity. But, um, of course, many Buddhists do believe in there being an entity 
that 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 they would classify as God. So so it's interesting that many of the religious faiths that believe in God uh, do a very similar thing to what the Christian faith does with me, with regard to uh, associating this human form as as something that they can connect to or relate to. Uh, and then as a part, basically a part of God. Mm. Um, and in the case of Islam, Muhammad is often... Uh, exactly. Mm. As the prophet. The prophet. Such as yourself. Yes. Is often worshipped in a sense. Yes. Although that is very strictly against the tenets, but yes. in a sense this is the case. That's right. And because it's for the same reasons, really, that the parental figure is sort of viewed as the overbearing father that, you know, you just have to obey. <laughs> yes. And even then that they don't really understand what they need to obey. So, so obviously there's, there's problems there. But, but the brotherly figure, the one that, you know, you can connect to is the one that you sort of spend a lot of your time feeling about or thinking about. And, and, and the problem with that is that it doesn't properly demonstrate God's openness. God is far more open emotionally and with regard to the flow of love and truth and every other quality that God has, than any person, individual person, could ever, ever be. Not just who, who we are now, but could ever be. So, so it makes really little sense to project, aside from this hurt emotional sense, it makes little sense to project all of these emotions towards a person that really belong you know, in your relationship with God. Mm. Yeah. Mm. There's also, unfortunately, I feel the perception of God is modified by that perception in that we, we're in some ways making God into a human with human yes. frailties and flaws. And there is a huge problem with that as well, obviously. The, from the relationship with God, we start seeing God as having flaws. He has creative flaws. He has personality flaws. He, he even, in many religious faiths, really is this autocratic uh, and domineering and even genocidal mm. <laughs> uh, figurehead that uh, it, you know is it enjoys almost the the destruction of the wicked mm. and and these kind of concepts all come about from this parental this damaged parental relationship that it happens on here on earth but unfortunately this causes a huge distortion in the person's ability to connect to God and actually have a relationship with God so. So that's the first problem I see, this really severe problem of how it affects the person's ability to have a relationship uh, with, yes. with God. Yes, certainly. Um, that, that is what uh, I observe and many here observe often. And the desire for God really to have uh, gone through a period of suffering <laughs> in, yes. in order to alleviate their suffering. Or in, even in order to understand their suffering. Yes, yeah. the sense that someone, God, without suffering cannot understand suffering. And what I find very interesting, uh, while understandable, is that the human, the person, um, when they are quite entrenched in their avoidance of their own suffering or their living in, as you would say, their suffering rather than uh, grieving and emotionally connecting mm. uh, to a healing process with regards to suffering. Then there is a great desire for others and especially God to, to uh, validate their suffering but also validate their living in like their, their uh, martyrdom, I suppose, <laughs> for mm. their sense that they are, will be perpetually suffering or that suffering uh, must need to be a part of life and therefore God must have suffered. Yeah, as you would know now, you know, obviously there's a lot of discussions we've got to have about God's character and mm. nature yet. Yes. With people, you know, there's not a lot of interest in God on the planet, really. And, and, that, and that is why we've not been able to share very much about God's character and nature. But, you know, if you, if you just analyse this one aspect of how projecting at myself or some other human as a God has an impact on, on the view of God, 
that's just a tiny little facet, isn't it, of the total amount of of damaged uh, belief systems that are about God that then influence a person's ability to ever become happy uh, and also ever to experience that relationship with God to the point where you become at one with God and, and conscious even of your own immortality. Yes. It, it's sort of like, it's very. I find it quite sad because you're connecting to a human or connecting to a human, you're never going to be conscious of your own in, immortality, which is a source of great happiness once, you, once you're once in that state. A- amazing, yeah. amazing happiness. And the, yeah. and the truth of God's nature is marvellous. Mm, yeah. And so, yeah, I find it quite sad in some ways that this projection uh, that people have towards humans being gods, it, and even like a lot of new age faith now believes that each of us are a part of God, even without there being any real relationship. And um, these kind of teachings are very, very damaging to a person's even even to a person's desire to connect to God. It, 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 it detunes from all of those things. And yeah, I, I sort of feel at some stage we're going to have to have some really proper in-depth conversations with people about God and God's nature. Um, that would be in wonderful. In comparison to a human and a human's nature. Type mm. Of thing. Yeah. Mm. Mm. yeah. Let us. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, and I feel that um, believing a person on earth who is, is a form of God or a part of God, uh, you know, Obviously, nowadays, people don't believe I am even Jesus, so, you know, <laughs> so, so they don't see it as projecting these feelings at me. But obviously, um, I can see the, the terrible damage it does to their own happiness and life mm. in terms of having these belief systems which are very clearly logically false um, and, yet, and yet very strongly held by most religious faiths. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Mm. And I will leave questioning, even though I'm <laughs> eager, <laughs> I will leave questioning you about your actual emotions. About that? Yes. To the end. No yes. worries. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So this confusion between you and God, is this something that has occurred since your life on earth? I mean, I'm asking questions that I yeah, you know, yeah, know I mean, the answers to. Yeah, but. of course, of course. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, yes, and perhaps what you could do actually uh, for, for our listeners, Stuart, is maybe show them a bit where it came from. Like I, I've discussed it many times in public and private, but nobody believes me because I'm, <laughs> I'm not Jesus in their mind. <laughs> um, so, you know, nobody really believes me where it came from. But yes. As, as you would know, it all pretty much came about after my passing and particularly generations after my passing. Obviously, the disciples right in the first century who were with me, they knew I was a human and, and yes. they knew what I taught about you know, God and God's nature to a degree. And they also understood that I was just obtaining a condition based upon the relationship with God, and that's what I was teaching them to do as well. So, you know, they understood all that, the very first generation, should we call them the first generation of true Christians, <laughs> mm. Mm. Um, understood all that. And you would have had the opportunity to even discuss with some of them what it was like yes. to be there in that state, you know, on earth, listening to a guy who's now saying he's the Messiah, and... Um, Sometimes they were impressed and other times, obviously, <laughs> they were quite uh, upset about what I had to say. You yes. know? And so, you know, they weren't, uh, you could say, you know, they certainly didn't believe me in me to be God because <laughs> they, in many cases, believed me to be completely fallible. <laughs> so that's funny in itself that the next generations of people turned my, you know, my statements and also um, what, what you know some of the miracles that were performed and so forth into evidence of the, of me being a god right and of course then they went and created a whole heap of other so-called evidence which was just figments of their imagination about what actually happened mm. yes and what i observe and um, find interesting is that many of the i feel sadness i suppose mm-hmm. about the 
deep alienation that there is between humans on earth and God. And in fact, many of my brothers and sisters here in the spirit world are also quite alienated from God, as mm. you know. And what, what, what I notice with regards to yourself or, or indeed many others that you have already mentioned is there is this, this like an inherent need within, within humanity to, to have a relationship with God, even when they feel alienated from God. It's difficult to describe. And I, what I observe is that many people are looking for a tangible God, if I could say it that way. And, mm. and so they, oft, they are eager, as was in the case of yourself, to, to have a God that they could relate to or to, to have a, a mysterious God, which is also mm -hmm. um, a common injury upon the earth. But but a, a sort of a lot of wonder and mystery and uh, mythology and miracles, <laughs> so, which surround yourself, obviously, but also this feeling that that there is a desire for God or to connect to God or to understand meaning and life. And when a person when when a person might represent God. They're very eager to, uh, to to attribute God to that person. Mm. Yeah, mm. yeah. It's a it's a ter it's a terrible thing, really, because it in a lot of ways denigrates God, but it also exalts the person beyond their mm. uh, beyond their true condition and capacity as well. No matter what, even even a person who's perfect, by by making them into God, you're basically turning a human into God and, and, and therefore not understanding God's true nature at any level, really, hmm. because you, you're just saying, oh, God's a perfect human, really. <laughs> and, and it, it, yeah, there's, there's so many problems with it that I see. And it is unfortunate and that the development uh, in the first three centuries uh, after my passing occurred, it was predictable, though, of course, hmm. because obviously... Um, you know, given human, the human uh, condition as it is even currently, it, it's very tempting to turn a person who has seemingly some unique abilities that that seem to be unique to that person, and to turn that person then into a god rather than to understand why that person actually has the unique abilities they have. So it's interesting, isn't it? Because really, what you're describing is an alienation from God mm -hmm. and the way that people, are, by having these beliefs about yourself, are actually preventing a relationship with God. But how fascinating as well that they are also preventing a relationship with yourself. That's right. Because they, they're not wanting to really connect with... The person. The person, as mm. a person. Mm. Very interesting. And I, and I notice that a lot now on Earth in this second visit because... Mm. If people were truly connecting to Jesus, the person, they would already know I'm here. Mm. Um, and so I just find it quite interesting in that regard that nobody really gets that Jesus is here. And, and that is interesting in itself because that means if you don't get that Jesus is here, then you've never been connected to Jesus in the first place, really. Mm. You've just been connected to an image of what you believe Jesus to be. Mm. And, that, and that's very interesting in itself. That it's, that it's really a figment of the imagination that you're connecting to, which, which means that you're not even connecting to anything that's real, um, which is very unfortunate. And also what I was reflecting upon as well is that the demonstration of change and the potential of a relationship with God and your personality and your human desires and all of these things, when a person holds the belief that you are God, then they miss out on not only connecting to you as a person, but also on understanding what it is you are doing. Mm -hmm. And yeah. that is something that even I have spoken with some who were around you in the first century, and even some of they uh, felt that they didn't pause long enough to understand what it was you were actually doing and demonstrating. Yeah, obviously now they know what, what yes. we were trying to achieve at the time, but... But at the time, yes, it was uh, difficult to 
even though they at the time didn't know I was a human. Obviously, many of them grew up with me and they knew me for many years. So they knew that I wasn't a God as is now portrayed by the Christian faith. But, but they still didn't really understand what I was talking about in many cases or why I had the desires that I had and what, what was motivating me to, to do what I did. And frequently they felt quite a large amount of error in what I was doing. They believed I was wrong and frequently tried to change my mind uh, about things, uh, sometimes, you know, overtly by discussion, but more often than not, <laughs> subvertly through, you know, manipulation. And, uh, and that, that, of course, made my life difficult. And in fact, in the end, caused my death mm. prematurely. Mm. So that it, it, it was their false concepts of God and me even that caused my premature death in the first century. So in celebratory, well, I'm conscious of not asking you too much about your feelings until we get sure, to that sure, point. Sure, sure. <laughs> <laughs> because I would like very much to discuss them. And yeah. it's a privilege to speak with you in person about it because I've observed many things over the years also. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you can point out the observations as yes. well, which would be good. Yes, yes. So uh, is there any further comments um, that you, I, I know there are many <laughs> about God? Mm. Or, um, but for the purposes of this discussion, I suppose I am particularly interested in the second two topics. Mm -hmm. okay. <laughs> but I do respect that this is a very important topic for yourself. And so if there is anything else that you would like to add, or t things that you think uh, are very important at this moment, please yeah. do say. Well, perhaps, uh, you know, obviously, as you would expect, my emotions about this God issue are pretty strong about, you know, how I'm perceived to be a God rather than, rather than a human. And it's causing us even a lot of difficulties now in terms of sharing God's truth, to be frank, because you know, most of the media, for example, the very first thing they accuse me of saying when I'm saying I'm Jesus is that, oh, so you're saying you're God. You know, yes. you've got to go through that entire discussion. No, I'm not saying I'm God. I am Jesus. But of course, the discussion that we have about me not saying I'm God never gets shown on telly yes. <laughs> or anything. It's only yes. the fact that I'm saying I'm Jesus and that they leave it in the hearts of the listeners to decide whether I'm saying I'm God or not even though I've said quite clearly afterwards that that's, I'm not God, you know. Yeah. So, you know, there's a lot of manipulation that goes on as a, of these false beliefs that goes on as well, mm. which actually prevent the planet from absorbing God's truth uh, in a real way. And, and so I sort of feel like there's this aspect of not only does it impact upon God's, the personal relationship the person has with God, but it also impacts severely on the personal relationship a person has with truth um, as well. And, and so I feel, and also uh, on the third thing, the, 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 the personal relationship the person has with love as a, as a concept, because it, because it denigrates truth and truth into this state of, oh, it's my truth, your truth. Mm. And it denigrates love into the state of, oh, what we have on earth is already love, you know, like when, when it's far from it. And so, you, you, you not only get this perception of God distorted now, but now because of these false beliefs associated with myself and other characters in other religious forms, um, you, get, you get this uh, like denigration and, and dilution of truth as well as a misrepresentation of love and what love really could be and what it should be and, and what it actually is from God's perspective. Do you mean by attributing, uh, I mean, I know there's many facets to what you've just said, but mm -hmm. do you mean by the attribution of your life in the first century with what was loving and truthful? Or do you, based on this false perception that you are God, or do you mean it because a person is prevented from an actual connection with God so the world is left with their versions of love and truth? Well, it's probably both. Um, there's, this, there's, there's this whole area, as you said, in the second part of that statement, where the concept of love and truth is highly distorted by believing that an individual that you're looking at is going to have the same kind of love that God has and, and, and at the same capacity and the same you know, ability and, and the same, even the same quality. 
because even though a person can become at one with God in love, obviously this is very, very different to being God and being able to demonstrate the infinite amount of that love. There's, a, there's this underlying complete limitation all the time uh, with the limited being, which, mm. which is going to be natural. But, but if you're attributing that limited being to having the same qualities of God, then basically you're limiting God mm -hmm. and, and therefore limiting the God's expression of love and, and, and how that love may feel when it enters you. And this is where I feel there's a lot of confusion about love on that regard on earth because what happens is they sort of be, believe that if I'm with them and I demonstrate some love towards them, it makes them feel warm and fuzzy type of thing. But when God's with them and he demonstrates love towards them, they feel like crying because it's overwhelming, right? And yes. so they feel like the crying form that they're getting from God is worse <laughs> than, than this gentle thing that they're getting from me because it's not intense from me, right? It's not as intense. And they then think that that's better. And, mm -hmm. and now there's a whole heap of distortion about how, how loving a person can come, become mm -hmm. even and what mm -hmm. their potential is. And so that, that's the love issue. And then on the truth issue, there's a whole heap of things I don't know anything about and, uh, and still don't know anything about. Obviously, uh, the fact that we've had 2,000 years in harmony with God, we can find a lot of truth and there are a lot of things we do know something about. But, but there's also, you know, obviously nearly an infinite amount of things we don't know anything about because God, being the infinite, would know and we, being limited, do not know. And so attributing to a human these godlike quality or being a god, you're basically saying that God is limited in the ability to uh, understand and, uh, or even uh, limited in his creative ability, limited in his ability to share truth, just like that human is. And while in the first century I did say statements like, you know, uh, there's a lot of things I'd like to say, but I can't share them with you yet. And, and that's a statement of my condition being the fact that, you know, now that I've learnt them, a person has to get into a state of being open to absorb those particular same things before they can learn them. And these kind of statements, unfortunately, were frequently interpreted as meaning that I knew a whole heap of things or knew everything. Um, and, and, you know, they had a limited knowledge and I couldn't even share what I knew because they, they couldn't ever understand what I, what I was saying. And, and this is not true. Yes, <laughs> yeah. I suppose by comparison it must... It must have seemed that you knew everything. <laughs> well, you know, obviously a person, you know, even in our discussions, hey, like there's this whole things uh, when we first met in the second sphere, uh, you were in the second sphere, even though you're observing my life, it's really interesting when you're observing someone who does know a whole heap of things because, because you can observe them but not understand that the reason why they know a whole heap of things is because, you know, they know something basic that you just haven't connected with yet, you know. So, so there's a lot of misunderstanding about how knowledge comes to the human from God and, and how, you know, the experiential method of finding the truth, how limited it, it actually is. And so unfortunately by perceiving someone to be God, they're actually limiting all that as well. All that discovery of truth, the speedy discovery of truth. Uh, you know, we've, in 2,000 years, we've discovered a lot of truth only because of our relationship with God. Yes. Uh, for no other reason. And you, you would know that now too, you know, yes. through your own experience in the last six months or so. You can see how rapidly you can absorb new truth given God's love and how it changes the soul and changes your mind. It changes how you think and changes how you see everything. And, and now how you analyse everything is all different. But all that is taken away from you when you believe God to be a human or that God could ever be in human form. Yes, mm. that's correct. Mm. Well, now, without trying to be funny or ironic, <laughs> I will ask you, well, I have two more questions on this topic. Sure. The first is what I'm calling a miracle question. Okay, yeah, <laughs> and that is to ask, what do you think the impact would be if suddenly... Nothing else changed on the earth except that the belief that you are God was removed. Mm. Um, I think it would have, well, particularly in the Christian world, it would have a significant impact upon a person's desire to have a relationship with God. For many Christians, because of the 
emotional feelings they have about the unapproachableness of God, I suppose you could call it. And for many of them, if they didn't have this association with Jesus being God, they'd probably go through a period of quite uh, a, 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 quite a lot of um, even anger, potentially, about the situation. Because you're taking away their God, but not... But, but their image of the actual God is all distorted based mm. upon the uh, parental figure relationship. And so now it's sort of like, well, oh, so, so God's not as human as we thought. God's not as kind as we thought. God's not as compassionate to our feelings as we thought. This is the way many would go, yes. unfortunately. Obviously, that's not how it is. It's a, a God's far more compassionate. God knows every reason why you're having every experience you have and knows everything that's wrong and can share with you everything that's wrong, whereas I, I can't share everything because I don't know everything. And, and, yet, and yet if you take Jesus away from the Christian, for many of them they would now hardly feel any connection to God, mm. unfortunately, because of that reason. However, after going through that particular initial phase, which, which is, a, is really about my addiction's not getting met more than anything else, <laughs> right? <laughs> and, I feel it would cause people then to go, okay, if God does exist um, and God is not human and, you know, Jesus is only a human, then there's this other aspect to it which is very interesting and that is, ah, if, if Jesus can become more, let's call it God-like through mm. the absorption of God's love, then that capacity is available to me. You see... Almost as if they would say, well, if he wasn't God, what was he up to? <laughs> exactly, exactly. Like, what is he up to and can I imitate it? Yeah. Can, I, can I do the same thing that he did? And, and this is where I see the perception of Jesus being God is very damaging because of what it does is it sort of makes, uh, it, 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 basically the human is basically saying then, ah, oh, we are all just humans, you know, we're always going to be human. We're always going to have this, uh, you know, limitations that we have. We're never going to be able to approach God, you know, because you look at what God's like. God's completely different. We're never going to be able to approach God. Let's not even try to do that. Let's not even attempt to have a relationship. And instead, we're just all going to wallow in our own, like, miserableness, you know, in, in, in the way it is on earth at the moment. For uh, because there's no solution to our current predictive predicament or problems, mm. and I sort of see that as a big problem too. Because because basically there's no inspiration, there's no desire then to actually go. Well, no, Jesus was a person, and he got closer and closer to God, and he demonstrated a whole heap of traits that changed over the course of his life, which which many of my friends would have observed. And, and as you know, when you're in spirit, you can ask them to come and talk to you about that. But on earth, people don't think of that. And then, and then what happens is that you then say, well, what's the point uh, of life and everything? We're, we're just all going to be the same for the rest of our life. And who knows what happens after your death? Because remember, the way a Christian generally sees my resurrection as, is as something special, something unique, something but it's not. It's just what every spirit, you know, every person who dies, as you know, goes through, you know. Yes. And you're able to materialise a human form afterwards if you, if you had the knowledge and power to do so, of course. But um, these kind of things are not considered. And as a result, when something is not imagined to be possible, then people don't even attempt mm. to try to do the possible. And it's like, it's like for many centuries... It was thought that that flight for humans was not even possible, you know, and so nobody even attempted to discover the scientific principles that determined flight. But once once humans started to believe that flight is possible, pro, you know, from a scientific perspective, now they attempted to make the discoveries needed in order to make flight a reality. And it's the same with our relationship with God. If you if you believe something is not possible for you, and for your relationship with God, then you're never going to attempt to try. You're never going to do it. And, and this is what I see the neg big negative impact mm. is having on the planet. Um, so you've discussed what it would be like for Christians. Mm -hmm. What do you feel the impact would be on non-Christians? Well, a lot of that depends on the kind of faith they hold on to. Obviously, 
Um, it, and, a, and a lot, see, and, and your question was based around about there not being a miracle or not being any of the other things. It was just specifically about Jesus not, not being God. Yes, I called a it a miracle question because yeah. nothing else is nothing changing, else has changed, but just just this that happens. one thing, which would be a miracle in itself, I think. But anyway, <laughs> yeah, uh, but I mean, a miracle—that's what I meant. A miracle would have to be performed for it to happen without anything else changing. Yeah, and obviously, change has to happen in the hearts of people, obviously, um, on that subject. But but um, assuming there's no other proof that that is true. And, but everyone started to come to just believe that, yeah, Jesus is not God. I, I think in a lot of ways it would make uh, many people more self-responsible uh, mm-hmm. as well. You know, instead of re- being reliant on a saviour figure, a person who's going to come along and rescue you from your troubles, which is, a, which is still an intense projection that I get even when we're doing seminars and everything. Yes. This is very intense projection. And, you rescue me from your Jesus, you need to, if you're Jesus, you would rescue me from my troubles. And you would then say, well, if, if Jesus is just a human, he's not going to be able to rescue me from my troubles. And, and also that you'd then start contemplating, well, where do my troubles come from? And, and, and perhaps I am uh, able to solve my own troubles. Mm. And, and therefore, there would be probably more self-responsibility as well in the individual rather than there being a reliance on some kind of saviour figure or some kind of person who's going to rescue you from, from your troubles of your life, rescue you from sin. <laughs> mm. and, and I have reflected upon this myself, for myself, given my background, which was r- largely atheistic, really, yeah, in reality, yeah, even yeah. though there was some yeah, it's interesting church where, going. It's an atheist, or, or previous atheist, we could say, yes. questioning Jesus about these yes. things about God. Yeah. But my belief is that there would be quite a change in those who consider themselves atheists. In fact, many of them feel, uh, may feel more attracted to what it is you are saying. Of course. And also more attracted to spirituality and God in general. Yes. Because and, I and the scientific of... discovery of those things. Yes. 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 No, I, I agree. And as you know, there are many atheists that have come to our seminars even now. Mm. And, and I, it, it's wonderful to see because basically it means that they're, you know, because of the statements that we're making about Jesus not being God, not claiming to be God, even the miracle statement, you know, Everything is based around scientific reality. It's not a miracle. Is not a miracle. There, there are what I would classify to be emotional miracles, but but um, but in terms of physical miracles, um, you know, they're all based on some some science, scientific fact that can be, you know, mathematically determined. And so that in itself would be very attractive, I think, to many atheists if. If they could get over the fact that we're saying uh, that I'm saying I'm Jesus and Mary's saying she's Mary Magdalene, and uh, and just listen to what's being taught, many of them would probably be quite attracted to what's being taught. Yes, and I suppose my point was that if if that one belief was gone from the planet, then even you saying that you're Jesus would cause them to be more attracted. Correct. Yeah, that, instead of there being, oh, he's just saying that he's God. What is some religious thing going on here now? You know, there's this common concept, as you know, we, we receive lots and lots of emails where people are expecting me to be their religious concept of, of, of Jesus rather than a person who's really just a scientist in a way. Like, a, like I'm not as dedicated, perhaps, a uh, scientist as what you may have been in your personal life with regard to your personal way you approach science. But, but in the end, uh, my science is the science of the discovery of God, of course. And, and in the end... Um, that's how I approach everything in my life and always have done, even, even in the first century my, I was like that. And so, you know, that would be attractive to many people who currently don't believe in God because they go, ah, oh, here's a guy who believes in God, but he's approaching everything very scientifically and logically with regard to this belief rather than it being a religious belief attached to religion in some way. And as we know, that in itself has many problems because... Religion itself has done a lot of damage historically uh, to to concepts of God and also to concepts of humanity. What what actually a human really is. 
So you take away the religion, it's like, almost like, you know, the song of John Lennon, you know, that there's no religion to type of thing. Mm. Imagine that there's no religion to. In a lot of ways, that's true, isn't it? If you yes. examine things, yes. there is no real religion uh, aside from, uh, you can believe in God as a scientific fact and also have a personal relationship with God without you being religious. <laughs> and that's, uh, that in itself, I think, is a fascinating subject on its own right that most people on the planet don't give much consideration to. Yes, mm. yes. Okay, on to my final question mm -hmm. in this, in this uh, subject. And that is, what will it take for that belief to be, now there's no miracle, <laughs> what will it take for that belief to be removed from people, do you think? Yeah, it's an interesting question, I, you know, and, and I do ponder about it even still sometimes. I, I think there's a number of things that it's going to require. I, I think it is going to require a miracle, to be honest, uh, in a lot of ways. Like, and when I say a miracle, here I'm talking about a demonstration of scientific principles currently unknown on the planet by a person who's claiming to be Jesus or claiming to be, you know, know Jesus or be, you know, or, or you know, know, and, know, and also know God, but demonstrating it as mathematical and scientific certainties rather than demonstrating it as some kind of religious faith. And do you f feel concerned that the, the same confusion could occur given the emotional condition within people, the tendency to desire a figurehead for God on earth? Well, um, I think... I think the way we chose to came is a critical part and come to earth is a critical part of that. If we had chosen to come to earth as we had the option to do and just by materialising human forms and start speaking truth on earth, I, I do feel that that would have been the net result uh, where everyone would have believed we're gods from some other galaxy or planet mm -hmm. and they would probably not have accepted what we were saying uh, and and you know, there would be a lot of unfortunate interpretations of what we were doing and that would have caused a huge amount of uproar and damage uh, on the planet in a very short period of time. So, so we had the option of coming that way, but, but um, coming that way would have caused so much terrible things happening on the earth in a very short, intense period of time that, that it would have been, you know, quite an unloving way to, to appear. The, the other option, of course, is the way we came, and that, uh, and that is to grow up as a child uh, with a recorded history mm. and a recorded, uh, recorded history of development in terms of, you know, childhood, you know, teenager, adult, uh, photographs taken, videos taken, a, a record of the person's life being produced, and then that person claiming to be a person who has returned and instead of being like the normal reincarnation claims, uh, has a whole, whole lot of knowledge that is currently not on the planet that uh, that that person is also bringing to the planet. And, and that is the most loving way to do this uh, task, uh, that we, and that's why we chose to do it that way. If you do it that way, um, obviously there's all this knowledge and there's already thousands of people listening to truth, uh, this knowledge, but of course uh, many of them still don't have enough faith to put that knowledge into personal application in their day-to-day -day life and without there being some kind of mathematical and scientific evidence is probably a best way of putting it, which people will classify as miracles but are actually just mathematical and scientific evidence. Um, without that scientific evidence by the person making the claim that they are you know, returned persons, um, it's highly unlikely that in the long run anyone is really going to change their mind on the subject of who Jesus is, mm. unfortunately. Mm. Mm. It feels very um, unfortunate from where I now stand mm. that such a disconnection can happen between really the whole of humanity and the most wonderful being in the universe mm. and... Mm. Uh, such an abundance of love and provision has mm -hmm. been made for each of us and it's so very difficult to, to observe and feel somewhat powerless at times. There are many things we can do, uh, but as you experience it, it is 
is a very well ingrained mm. set of beliefs. Yes. And, and it's even more difficult as a spirit, isn't it? Because mm. uh, you've got to go by impression and, and, um, and it's got to have to be a loving impression. It's not something you can force somebody into doing. And because it's a spiritual uh, construct about love that you're trying to share and truth, uh, obviously there's law-based limitations because of a person's free will. There's law-based limitations that uh, determine how much you can sort of impact their life and share this particular material as a spirit well you know obviously as a human now back on earth it's a bit easier when i say easier you couldn't certainly <laughs> would never say it's easy no. <laughs> um, but it's easier in the sense that at least you can make these statements that about truth that would not normally even be received if a person was just doing it as a spirit and so so at least we can make the statements uh, that we are making about God and God's truth and, the, you know, the full uh, a subset of, the, of, you know, the truths that we've discovered about God. At least we can verbalise that and put them into words. But even then, the, as you know, the, the emotional feelings in people about the other claims that we have to also make because of truth <laughs> um, then impact upon whether a person listens to those mm. statements or not, mm. unfortunately. Mm. Mm. So it's a very complicated situation we're in in some ways and, and, and I, I, feel, I feel a lot of trust that when and if God wants uh, us to move into this phase of, you know, and God, God knows when the world is more ready, you know, at this stage. I sort of feel and can see that the, the world's developing into a readiness and hopefully it does so within our lifetime while we're here. And I feel quite strongly that God would not have sent us here or given us the ability to come here without there being that potential. And all the 14 still need to make changes and do the things they need to do to embrace that pro possibility, of course, because they have free will too. Mm. But... You know, unless that happens, I, I can't see there being any significant major change in a short period of time. You know, the way human development has occurred is that change has happened over long periods of time. But uh, for the change to happen within a generation or two, there has to be a major influx of truth, people listening to truth, and people also then applying it in their personal lives. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Yes, yes. Well... So now we've spoken a little about the confusion of yourself and the celebration of yourself as God. Mm -hmm. Perhaps now we can move on to our second subject, which is what is the correct way to celebrate someone who has demonstrated so much love and so much leadership? And I am here referring to yourself, but in general terms even. You know, as I, and I, you know, here I do have some emotional injuries on these subjects that we're now starting to discuss. So, you know, obviously you probably be able to correct some of them better than than, than I can. But well, and I have the benefit of seeing how you are. Uh, I suppose it really is. It's not quite exactly the right word, but how you are celebrated or remembered and discussed here mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. how you are welcomed and mm. many things. Mm. Yeah. yeah, and I suppose it gets down to the concept of honour and how you honour a person for their personal effort and desire, isn't yes. it? Yes, yes. And, and I, feel, I feel that applies to anybody who has personal effort and desire for any type of discovery that's going to benefit humanity. There is, you know... A degree uh, of there is, uh, and I find this quite interesting on a physical level. Humanity at the moment, particularly people on Earth, do honour people who have discovered specific things. You know, like I was just reading an article uh, recently about the man, the, the the chain of events that led up to the uh, development of a of an operating system on Earth for computers called Linux, and. And, you know, the persons who led to that uh, development of that software uh, are honoured by the rest of the community. And so, and so what happens is if, if those kind of men go and are going to have a technical discussion, there's a lot of people who, who go and attend because they honour the man for what he, he, you know, and or the group of men in this okay. case, for what they have achieved and, 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 and what they now allow 
the rest of humanity to utilise through their discovery. Mm -hmm. And we see this happening in pretty much every walk of life physically. You know, so yes, it is true and correct to uh, when one, what I have experienced and observed is that when one connects and has, a, has an understanding of what has been done by an individual, especially in the form of a gift, there is a, there is a natural respect and recognition that is afforded that person. Naturally. Naturally. Yes. Yes. As you would, because you, the, the, if you truly appreciate that gift, you would realise that left to your own devices, you possibly would not have done what they did. So th that's an interesting feeling in itself, isn't it? When you had go through that feeling, yes, you would realise that, wow, if you were left to your own devices, you like if I was left to my own devices with regard to computers, I would definitely not have made a Linux operating system. <laughs> <laughs> you know, probably, you know, highly likely anyway. <laughs> you know, I don't have well, enough. I don't have enough drive for it. Let's put it that way. You know, it's not. It's not my primary passion or anything like that. Was that a pun? <laughs> <laughs> enough drive. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but um, you know, but it, but it is something you can honour because that person did have enough drive. They they yes. did. And, and a lot of people who have discovered things scientifically in history have had to, um, you know, they've had personal sacrifices, they've generally made. Frequently, they have been denigrated by the rest of society in many ways initially. And, uh, and so, you know, obviously they have had to go through some personal traumas usually mm. to, to, in order to share new things with the planet that, that the planet generally is not accepting of. And so... It feels to me that, you know, it's proper to honour such, such a drive and a desire. In the yes, and uh, perhaps I could speak a little about what it's like here mm -hmm. when we celebrate or honour a person. And what is wonderful to experience is the fact that celebrations naturally occur because it, they come from the wellspring of love and gratitude that exists within each individual exactly. that wants expression. And, and so that, that desire for expression leads, and it's especially beautiful when there is a group who all have that same desire and, and immense gratitude, that then they come together to create something uh, s almost seamlessly. Mm -hmm. It happens here. but. Mm. But it becomes a party or a celebration just by nature of that uh, desire to express such love or gratitude. And, and even, as you know, even if it isn't someone who has given to themselves, the, the, if there is a recognition, so now I'm not speaking uh, of you directly, uh, because in reality everyone here has benefited from you. But perhaps now if we discuss a different person where th this person has not given perhaps directly to me, but I have a recognition of what it is they have done and I feel a level of love and joy and a desire to honour what they have done. And it brings forth uh, actions and uh, emotions and laughter mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. music and many things mm -hmm. that, that cause us to come together in celebration. Mm -hmm. Yeah, celebrations in the spirit world, particularly in the celestial heavens, are very wonderful, aren't they? And, um, yeah. Yes, and and I suppose that uh, I suppose that we would see more celebrations. Well, I know that we would see more celebrations on the earth if this wellspring of emotion existed within a person. Yes, like you know, like a. And also, the, the, as you say correctly, it's a, with people you express your gratitude, it's a part of expressing your gratitude mm -hmm. for their achievements, isn't mm -hmm. it? And how those achievements have had a personal impact upon your own life and, and, and also saved you yes. from, from further trauma by having to go through the discovery of those particular things yourself. Uh, so obviously, every person who goes through some form of discovery of things obviously it does deserve our honour mm. uh, because, because at the end of the day they have assisted our life in some way that might not otherwise have been achieved. And, and as you now know too, God has created all of us so that each of us are going to be honoured in some way because each of us will add to the universal collection of knowledge in some way 
that others cannot do because of our personality and nature that God's inbuilt. So, so see, it, and and it's really interesting, isn't it? Comparing honor on earth compared to honor in the spirit world. Honor in the spirit world is very purely expressed and and not addictively expressed. And and honor on earth are very much different. It's a lot. It's a lot about personal uh, feelings of you know wanting attention and approval and other things like that. And so yeah, you know, quite often I feel very uncomfortable on earth when somebody does honor me in that way when it's not a, it's not a real way anyway mm. Mm. Uh, so it just feels very distorted and and out of harmony with god's truth and love as well so so that's why on earth um it's very rare to me for me e- even now as you would know to accept the honor from individuals uh, because most of the time it's still quite distorted well, and this is where, yes, and I agree with you, but mm-hmm. I also see there is this other problem that you have, which is... <laughs> a I thought we were getting those later. <laughs> <laughs> Let's get to them later then. That's all right. I'm just say, uh, saying, if we uh, stay on the subject of this, uh, because we, we can talk about these problems, I, I do want to talk about them. I'm not trying to avoid the subject, but, um, but I just sort of feel that... Uh, a lot of people on earth who do receive so-called honour and respect, like many musicians and actors and you know people in politics who are powerful and these kind of people do receive the honour and respect of others, but frequently it's very flawed in the way that it's expressed and, and also flawed in the individual in terms of what they desire from it as well. Mm-hmm. Um, so that, you know, I think we need to make sure that with our audience that we're not talking about that kind of honour here. No, mm. no. Mm. It is sad, isn't it, that m- many um, there is a there is a flow of emotion, but it is through the the uh, addiction of yeah. each person on earth, and mm. so honor does occur and celebration, but it is often because of uh, the the wellspring, if you like. <laughs> being quite muddied (laughs) and uh, it does cause a rise of emotion but mainly through codependent addictions that each is meeting for the other that's right yes which is which is unfortunate because that causes a destruction of a person's self-identity as well as a destruction of their relationship with god yes it's unfortunate yeah so yeah so so from the honor getting back to the honor question uh, my sort of Feel, uh, what was the real question again? If we go back to <laughs> well, the, the question you were asking, and and perhaps uh, I have I have answered it in fact. And <laughs> perhaps I was setting you up for the third set of questions. Uh, yeah, <laughs> You'll forgive me, won't you? No, no, no not at all. <laughs> no, the I was thinking though there are some interesting facets to that question though with about regard to honour. The correct way to, to honour honor someone who has given or led something very yeah, powerful. There's a second aspect to it I'd probably like to discuss, and that is this honour um, by by honouring what they uh, by by honouring what they discovered. Mm-hmm. Um, sort of, a, and this is the. Um, how do you honour what a person's discovered? Well, you utilise it, you understand it, you study it, you, you know what I mean? Like, yes. uh, like these are things that I feel are missing from a lot of honour on earth uh, as well, you know. Yeah, yeah. Mm. But interesting, isn't it, that many times, especially upon the earth, the person first must utilise the gift before appreciating the gift Correct. before feeling gratitude for the gift Correct. whereas here we have more of a um, connection with truth and love which enables us to observe gifts and to appreciate gifts without directly benefiting from them from ourselves. themselves yeah mm-hmm. so here on earth it, it, it's a sort of like this selfish component isn't it to yes. the honor which is that person's benefited me personally my life my my happiness has improved as a result of what that person has done. Now I will honour them rather than going, oh, well, hang a sec, that person might have benefited all those people over there, but I personally have not benefited, but they still deserve my honour, Yes, uh, really. Or they uh, would uh, cause a feeling of honour. Yeah, and coming that, from you. Yeah. And that is something <clears throat> that is, I find, is important, is that the honour 
comes from an emotional condition within. And yes. as you have pointed, well, a, a, perhaps we can discuss how much hollow honour is practised upon the earth. Yes. Yeah, no, that's a big issue too, isn't it? In where, itself? where people are told they must honour yes. uh, someone or uh, through an emotional injury. <laughs> yes. Um, so, so if we compare the two types, there's this must honour, which, yes. which a lot of people in authority demand. Mm. So, you know, it's like a dictator ruler demanding honour when really he should not not really be honoured at all. He's doing a lot of destructive things and hurtful things to humanity. He, he, in the spirit world, he would not be honoured for those things. Um, he may be honoured for his personality or nature at some pure level, but certainly would not be honoured for the destruction that he's, that he's um, you know, perpetrating. Then there's the honour, so that's the honour that's demanded by people who don't deserve it, <laughs> really. And then there's the honour that comes uh, to people who feed the addictions of humanity. And you see this a lot when, you know, we just went to, a, to some mediumship a few weeks ago and you saw it there, you know, yes. this man just feeding the addictions of people over and over again. And so he's honoured, he's listened mm -hmm. to, he's respected, and he's sharing a whole heap of untruth. He's actually quite uh, strongly harming every person present, but, but um, they all believe that he's helping them because their addictions are being met through it. And you see this a lot with musicians and artists and people like that where where, you know, the, their music, for example, evokes a feeling in you. Mm. Um, of course, it's a, oftentimes a distorted feeling, you know, like, you know, sometimes it's rage or other feelings, but you connect with the feeling that the person is expressing in their music or in their art. And so you now honour them. You think they're wonderful. And, you know, if you met them down the street, you'd be wanting to take a photo with them and all these kind of things. But all of that also is um, hollow honour because it, because all they're doing really is meeting a flaw in you mm. with one of their own flaws. And, uh, and obviously that's not beneficial to humanity either. Mm. So, so I sort of see a lot of honour going on on the planet at the moment to different people as being a very distorted uh, and, and unfortunate, un, uh, very unfortunate in many cases, because it actually degrades the condition of both the person being honoured and the person is doing the honouring. Mm. Mm. But let's not neglect the point that you were making, which was about uh, how one demonstrates honour, not just through celebration, but mm -hmm. through um, study and utilisation and... and uh, application. Application. Yes. Mm. To my mind, that is a, a big... That, that's probably the biggest way you honour what a person has discovered. You know, like... Orville and Wilbur Wright, the, and they weren't the only people involved in the discovery or, or the principles of flight, obviously, but, but you can see by, by us flying, uh, we're all really honouring them in, <laughs> in, by utilising what they discovered, mm. and, and we're all really honouring their creation. And, and that's a, uh, to my mind, that's a very pure form of honour in some ways because it, it, it acknowledges the benefit to humanity that that person had. And, and makes use of that benefit. Correct, yeah. yeah Whereas yeah. If, if, if they made the discovery and nobody ever... Uh, Utilised it. ...constructed anything beyond what they had constructed. Yeah. It's interesting comparing some historical figures like that back, back from the 19th, late 19th uh, uh, century, early 20th century. If you compare someone like Orbel and Wilbur Wright, uh, you know, who discovered the aeroplane, basically, and, uh, well, not discovered it, but a lot of the principles mm -hmm. they put into practical application, obviously. And there was a whole heap of people doing it all at the same time, obviously, in competition. But that's interesting in itself, too, the fact that they were able to compete rather than... <laughs> work together. <laughs> work together. They would have done it a lot faster then, right? Yeah. But, but no, they had to compete you know, for lots of reasons. But... Um, but you compare that with someone like Tesla, who, who basically discovered AC electric current that we all use today, and how little he is understood or known compared to someone, you know, someone like the people who discovered flight. And you can see that uh, many times the, you know, the actual people who are responsible for discoveries on the planet are often either lied about, completely misrepresented, or even tried to rub, you know, historians have even tried, you know, rulers in particular, 
have tried to rub them out of human history altogether mm -hmm. and attribute then their discovery to themselves. And so there's a lot of people on earth that we haven't got to honour yes. uh, in an appropriate way because we don't even know what they did or discovered. And, and often those discoveries or what they did were attributed to others. This is still a joy for me here to, to see how intricately God measures every contribution and, mm. and really how much I am becoming sensitive to the, to, the, to the history of a person when I encounter them and mm. their contributions and their decisions and what that has led to. Yeah. The fortunate thing in the spirit world is that high you go in the spheres, you can read the truth of yes. what actually happened rather than... Yeah. And of course, you know, most people on earth wouldn't be aware, but there are books written in the spirit world that not only show you the book that was written in error, but also have a commentary about all the errors, <laughs> which is very helpful in the lower spheres of the yes. spirit world. Obviously, once you become one with God, you don't need those particular things in order to assess the truthfulness of a person's conditional statements or, or claims. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Okay. <laughs> well, let's move on to this third subject that I wanted to discuss with you. Yeah, sure. And that is your feelings and emotions about how you are uh, recognised, celebrated, commemorated on earth uh, today. Yes. So... Are we going to discuss about this in the spirit world as well, or is this just, <laughs> <laughs> just on earth, this one? <laughs> yes. Well... As you know, there's far less error about the way that you are celebrated, especially uh, in the beyond the second or third sphere. Yeah, uh, yeah. And so we can, you're right, we should discuss the both. <laughs> well, perhaps, uh, like I can easily give the perspective of the one on earth, but perhaps it's better the perspective of the one coming from the spirit world comes from yourself. But your feeling, I'm very interested. Oh, certainly, in I'll talk to my feelings about <laughs> both, that's fine. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yes, so, so let's commence. Yeah. So how, how do you feel? Uh, how do you feel today, now, about how you are viewed and celebrated? Well, uh, well uh, in terms of how I'm celebrated on earth, I don't even really see it as me being celebrated on earth, to be honest. Because it, it, it's um, to, to properly, I feel to, to properly honour someone or celebrate them, you need to know the truth about them. And because there is so much untruth about myself as a person on the planet, that exists on the planet, and firstly, nobody even understands that we are back, or very few people understand that, you know, that we're back on Earth. But, but also very few people understand you know, the truth about our nature, our character, our personality, um, and all the other things that are basically required to properly celebrate a person, I feel. So it feels to me that the, the celebrations that occur as a result of, you know, Christmas in particular and Easter time and so forth, which, are, which have different connotations in themselves, one being my death being the saving of mankind and the other being my birth being the, uh, the heralding of a new age sort of thing. But... But in both cases, uh, there's a lot of false beliefs associated with those two things. And, and so it's very, very, well, I, well, basically, I don't accept any of that as, as personal honour or celebration of my life. And so to me, it's almost like they're celebrating a figment of their own imagination uh, or of their own creation, rather than celebrating my life or my discoveries as an individual or our life, uh, you know, the, for Mary in my life. But so it's, it's, it's a strange feeling. It's, it's, it's sort of like... Yes, and I understand that you don't see any of that as real celebration and we would agree with you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but however, I am interested in the impact that such celebrations uh, or such commemorations of you such such attitudes towards you because remember we spoke about the attitudes towards you but we didn't yet get to speak about yeah, your feelings, feelings about, about it, it. Yeah. so for example the the recognition of you as god how that feels for you yeah yeah so yeah with regard to how it feels for me the celebrations that are conducted on earth it's it's sort of interesting because it's sort of like 
on in some ways I feel quite sad about it all because of um, and and I still probably haven't processed through my sadness about it all like because some of the sadness is more personal and then some of the sadness is about just general feelings I have about how that impacts on everybody's relationship with God and the truth and things like that as well so so perhaps if I divide it into those two areas please do yeah so the first area is uh, about just sadness associated with how that inf interferes with and influences everyone's relationship with God so there has been times where uh, in this life that I've during Christmas and New Year period in particular uh, and also at Easter time I've gotten quite uh, sad and 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 in when I wasn't feeling my emotions uh, before I realised who I was, I'd actually get quite depressed as well during that period of time. So um, I've never in this life really had celebrations of Christmas and Easter. Uh, growing up as a Jehovah's Witness, they don't really celebrate both of those occurrences. Uh, the Easter celebration is more a memorialisation mm. of my death. And, and the Christmas celebration is not uh, engaged at all because it was thought by that faith to be pagan. And so, and so I've always had the experience of being uh, quite uh, disconnected from what everybody's doing during those periods of time as a result of that upbringing and also as a result of my own emotional feelings about um, people having these kind of feelings towards myself not even, and they don't even get that it's towards myself in many cases because they believe myself to be God. And so it, there's, a lot, there's a lot of really quiet, like a lot of sad feelings. And, and as I said before, I really connected emotionally. A, a lot of times I'd be quite depressed during that period of time, as you would have observed, Yes. you know, where I'd be alone. And frequently uh, during my 20s and 30s, during the Christmas New Year period, it, it, that's a period that most people on earth are usually in a holiday with each other or doing things together with each other, family type things. And frequently I'd be completely alone mm. um, during that period of time for, for a fair period of time, usually from Christmas through to late after New Year's, I'd be completely alone and, uh, and feeling quite alone actually during that period of time. Mm. Yeah. And a lot of that was about, it just feels uh, that a lot of my feelings about God and God's, the, God, what kind of relationship God wants with humanity we're all being denied at that point of time, uh, mm -hmm. more than any other point in time in, in, in a year. It's like because of, the, because of the untruth involved in the whole thing. So, so that was, so that was uh, one aspect of it. And then the second aspect of it is sort of like personal feelings about it, just this uh, probably deep sadness that nobody really understands or, or, or gets anything about myself or my nature or my personality, or or what I chose to do um, in my life, my two thousand years of life, and there's this other sub aspect to it, and that is it's always focused on two thousand years ago rather than what what I am in between that time. Uh, it's sort of like it's almost like humanity at the moment sees me as always being the two thousand year old their two thousand year old concept of me mm. uh, not understanding that i'm as as i would be if i was growing closer and closer with god that i'm a growing individual that changes over time and therefore not understanding my current you know position or of responsibilities or 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 nature or personality uh, not not understanding that actually just like they are growing individuals who are developing, so am I. And so, so there's this sort of, uh, I'm always thought to be the same person as I was then. Uh, you know, at Christmas time, I'm, I'm still a baby almost. <laughs> and then at, uh, at Easter time, I'm a person dying on a cross and there's not much between in terms of the concept that people have or the thoughts that people have about what was actually achieved because in most cases, they don't even know what was achieved. You know, they don't understand what I was trying to teach all and, that time. And so this perception also that you are God incarnate uh, would also um, diminish. It sounds like you're saying that that would 
diminish uh, recognition of the effort that you put in to make changes. Yes, yeah, so, so uh, there's almost this presumption that I didn't have to do anything and I was perfect right from the beginning and everything was great and I didn't have a traumatic life at all and yeah. it wasn't difficult at times and uh, it's sort of like a diminishing of actually what I did do in many cases by saying that I'm God. They're basically saying that really God did all those things and, yes. and while God did a lot of things and has done a lot of things for me, the reality is I had to use my will and desire in a specific way in order for those things to occur. And there was a lot of opposition, far more opposition than what anyone on earth has experienced at this stage to their development of whatever it is they discovered. Um, and people don't really understand that either. Or just, uh, you know, there's a, the huge amount of uh, opposition to to the discoveries of truth regarding God and God's universal laws on the planet. It means that the person who's the first person trying to discover them is going to receive a lot of opposition personally. And, and there's no real concept of that either. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes. So, so far you've said there's been elements of um, sadness. Yeah about the misconceptions and about the, the really skipping over of your efforts when you were on Earth the first time and in the years since. And even on this <laughs> and time, even and definitely now. now. I mean, yes. is it now nobody even, uh, you know, really gets that I am who I am. Yes. So, uh, and because there's not much external evidence that they feel that they can touch, obviously there is a lot of evidence. And if anybody lived by life, they would see, you know, the evidence that's there but the reality is they're living their own lives and of course they don't see that evidence so mm. um you know the reality is there that there's not much external evidence for them and as a result of that um you know no one really agrees that uh, and in fact not only do they not agree but there's obviously direct attack mm. uh you know about me even saying the truth about my own identity let alone let alone the things that i'm trying to teach Yes. Yeah. Yes. And oftentimes it, my identity is used as a, or let's say their belief that I am not who I'm claiming to be is used as an excuse to not even listen to anything that I'm teaching, which is sad in itself because it means basically that the, my identity now is like a dog chasing me around, biting me. <laughs> Does that make sense? And in the sense that it's, in the sense that it causes people to not even listen at all. Mm. And it's very interesting that uh, uh, the way the media portrays things sometimes because they portray it like I'm saying I'm Jesus and everybody listens to me. Actually, the, the, nothing could be further than the truth. I'm saying that I'm Jesus and because I am the actual Jesus, nobody listens to me. Everybody mistrusts me without exception. You know, uh, there's not a single person who doesn't feel they can argue or fight or, you know, or, or mistrust or any of those things. And so because of that, there's a, there's a lot of sadness that I have to deal with about that, uh, the generalised treatment that goes on as a result of me just having to say who I am and then having to bear the brunt of, you know, all of this uh, false concepts of who I should be. Yes, and, and that is very much related to beliefs about you. It's, it's like, a com as you said, it's a compounding problem almost where mm -hmm. there are all of these misconceptions and commemorations of you that exist on the earth already uh, and that deny the truth. And then when you say that you are who you are, even then the... the um, lack of belief in that is impacted upon by the the untruths about you that exist in the first place mm. and it's, the very fact that you are so well known that's right yeah so it's it's difficult on a lot of levels really it's a um you know a difficult personally in the sense that you get personally attacked and denigrated a lot but it's also difficult from an aspect of truth the sharing of truth because you know, nobody really gives you a chance to state the truth without there first being this underlying feeling that, oh, why am I even listening to this man? He says he's Jesus. Why, why am I even going there? You know what I mean? Why, 
Why am I even considering the, the, to, uh, that I should be listening to the person? And in some ways, given the amount of uh, that amount of you know, heaviness that's around the subject, and then on top of that, the high level of spirit influence are on the subject as well, because obviously there's a lot of you know Christian spirits in the spirit world who have yet to progress to above the you know first sphere, who have their own uh, opposition to what I'm now trying to do. And so the irony is they believe, they think they believe in Jesus, but they are opposing Jesus, doing exactly what Jesus wants to do. And they don't even understand that they are. And, yeah. and so, because they don't even believe that I am Jesus, so they don't even understand that that's what they're doing. And so you get this high level of opposition as well through that process of belief systems that have, have all probably wouldn't be there if it wasn't for these false belief systems, mm. ironically. And, uh, and so... Just coming to Earth, and quite often I have this, uh, sometimes this feeling of anger and frustration about, like, why did we even come? Because it's like, um, I'm trying to benefit humanity by helping them see the error of these false belief systems, while at the same time being attacked by the very persons I came to help and assist. Mm. <laughs> so, you know, there, there's a lot of those kind of feelings too at yes. times uh, that, I, that I have to go through, yeah? Yes, mm. yeah. Mm. Mm. So it's quite a complicated uh, set of emotions, really, um, in in a lot of ways, because it it's it, on a, it it's difficult because I know who I am, and I know and I you know my my memories and my uh, my knowledge of truth is such that um, anybody who wants to put what I say into practice will probably find out it's going to be true if they have that personal experience. Mm. But most people won't even engage the personal experience at all. Because of, because of me claiming to be something that actually it, it, someone who they don't believe I could be. Yes. 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 And so then when they celebrate my life, uh, it's, I don't feel it's me they're celebrating. In fact, if anything, the very people who say they celebrate my life are the very people who are actually attacking me more. Mm. That's that's normally the case. Mm. So they say they're celebrating Jesus' life while at the same time attacking Jesus who has returned uh, because they didn't recognise the return because, as I said in the first century, most wouldn't uh, recognise my return because their condition would be such that they wouldn't be able to. Mm. And do you, do you believe that if, if um, another miracle question, by some miracle, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, people began to understand that you are Jesus, would they then, it seems logical that they would then transfer all of their false beliefs now upon yourself? Yes, it's highly likely, unfortunately. Mm. So, but, but at least there would be a mechanism to correct them. Mm. Um, so, so while they would transfer their false beliefs onto me and, and therefore I'd have, to correct, uh, I'd have to go through a process of correcting their false beliefs, but at least there is the chance of correcting them. Whereas at the moment, it's almost like there is no chance of correcting them because of the, you know, not only the false beliefs, but also the fact that they're not uh, open to receiving the truth about the matter. Uh, whereas at least if uh, they started to believe that I was and then projected all these false beliefs, I could then correct the false beliefs at least in some kind of interaction. Of course, there's going to be emotions that are, that are going to have to be gone through because all false beliefs come from some emotional source as you now know yes and so you know obviously it's going to take a bit of time for them to work through those issues but at least there would be a mechanism of correction mm. uh, whereas mm. at the moment um, people don't perceive my the truth that I share as evidence enough of my identity generally you know there's some that do but yeah. generally uh, most people don't and also because uh, as I grow, my condition of love uh, obviously improves, but my condition of love then is in greater disharmony with what people on earth believe to love to be. They then feel that I'm getting in a worse condition rather than a better one. And as a result of that, many who have listened in the past now no longer want to listen. And then they add their weight to the the general misgivings about me, my claims, 
and and which then of course causes even more attack on, on myself as a person so you know it's a it's a very difficult uh period of time that we're going through until such a time as we get into that state where we feel you know all the error has gone within us uh, I can see that once we get to that state, uh, you're in such a happy condition with God that all of this uh, shenanigans going on <laughs> on the side doesn't matter to you personally so much. But at the moment, I've still got a lot of feelings about, you know, that I need to process about those particular things. Yes. Yeah. It, it, there's a lot of compassion here for you it, with regards to the, the polarisation that does happen around mm. you and... Mm -hmm. As you say, it's a, a polarisation in the negative most often. Mm. The, the level of hatred is quite extreme mm. um, that I generally have to uh, deal with on a daily basis. And it's far more extreme than what... It, generally, hatred that's perpetrated on the planet is very rare to have it perpetrated towards an individual to such, a, to such an extreme yes. degree. Mm. Um, you know, so... That, uh, you know, that is one thing I do find difficult to, um, to process emotionally because it, 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 um, what I'm finding is that I already have a fairly poor perception of myself as AJ uh, and that's driven by some false beliefs that come from my childhood that I've yet to process and then to have all that happen on top just adds to the uh, difficulty of processing it more than anything else. Mm. Yeah. Well, perhaps then we could speak about this contrast that I want mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. um, discuss with you because really some of those feelings that you were just raising are things that I feel are preventing you from receiving the honour, the true honour, the honour that's, that's this wellspring of gratitude uh, in full recognition of the truth of what you have done. Mm. Uh, from particularly from us here, mm. your spirit friends. Yeah, no, yes. I'd agree with that. I, I I do have moments, as you know, where I'm say reading Afra's books. You know, like you know where, where I'm reading the life of. The and music. isn't Afra an interesting character? <laughs> yeah, yeah, of course. <laughs> Everyone is an interesting character <laughs> in some way, though. <laughs> but yeah, you know the fact that he, like I've just seen those books as a great uh, like a great help for me because it there's actual statements of truth about my life to a, de to a large degree in the books. And, and also there is that honour, the practical honour, uh, as well as I read, that I feel at times. And, and as you know, I cry a lot about that. But, um, but, but that's about the only thing I've ever read that's had that kind of real uh, effect on, you know, me processing it through it emotionally properly. Mm. Yeah. It, it Again, there is much compassion for you here, but we, we do see that you are, um, you are preventing the flow of God's love and even the flow of our love mm. based on those beliefs and feelings that you have about mm. yourself. Mm. You have, as you say, extreme um, examples of people treating you even worse than you feel about yourself. Mm. Uh, but then... You also have extreme examples here of us wishing to gift you with some of that gratitude mm. and to, to share that celebration of who you are and what you have achieved and, and really who you are. I want to say who you are. Yeah, I, I sort of find at the moment, you know, as you know, I've recently been feeling about this personal shame sort of that I carry and, and you know, how deep it is inside of me. It's like a and I'm still, as you know, struggling to connect to it in a real way. You know, I have my, my moments where I can connect to it briefly at the moment, but I'm not really connecting it to it properly at the moment, as you know. But I do feel quite confident that if I can connect to that properly mm. and release it, it's like the, the, I see it as an issue of preclusion uh, mm. in my soul at the moment, just this issue of like I've got this sort of such a deep level of personal shame, which which actually I'm recognising does come from the history of treatment, particularly that I've endured in this life. And I've got this sort of history of feeling this personal, like, a, like this, this personal feeling that I've done something absolutely terrible type of feeling that I need to, you know, that I'm never going to get out of. And if I can get 
uh, through that emotionally, I now feel like, wow, I, like my life's going to significantly change. I'll be able to feel the love of my brothers and sisters in the spirit world, even though I, there's not much love for me here. And, and I'll also um, be able to feel God's love more as well, which will greatly aid me in my, you know, my future progress. So I'm sort of aware of that, but I'm really struggling with the issue of preclusion in terms of this emotion in me and how to get it out, you know, like <laughs> how, to, how to get rid of it out of, out of me. Um, and what what is it about? Like I, I I'm still almost like I don't. It's because it entered me in such a young age, a pre-verbal age in this life. You know, it entered me. I, I know that it entered me in the womb, actually. So mm-hmm. it's very hard for me to even connect to it in such a way that I can. Un, uh, like I've, in the past, I've always had some kind of events I can process through or whatever. Mm-hmm memories of specific events and so forth but it's almost like i've got to process through many events that i've now experienced in my first century life and now but from a position of shame you know like yes. uh, and that's sort of dawning on me recently mm-hmm. and so i know that's what i need to do but but i'm still not really um not i'm not really connecting to that properly mm-hmm. at this stage as you would know yes yeah. yes mm. And from our perspective, we see that you're more comfortable with with attack than you are with great preference of love. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's probably true. I, I don't know. Like in some ways I sort of feel like, I don't know if it's a comfort, it's just I expect it. It's a way of managing my grief about it. Yes. It's sort of like I can see that I'm sort of managing my grief about attack by just expecting now that I'm just going to get attacked no matter what I do, rather than sort of having a bit more self uh, feeling of, of, no, I don't deserve this level of attack, mm. a- and then work from that position and work through my grief that way. It's like it's, uh, I can see that I'm, I can't uh, forgive properly this level of attack yet because I don't yet fully acknowledge the extent of it and also fully acknowledge its unfairness and things like that. I'm sort of just going, well, that's the position I'm in. You know, that's how it's, what it's like being first type of thing. Mm. And in some ways, having that feeling, I can see dismisses the emotion and therefore prevents me from processing the emotion. Yes. So, so that's something that I'm having to work my way through, just stop to stop dismissing it. Mm. And, and so we've done... As you know, we're doing, starting to do things now where we are being more firm about bad treatment of ourselves and things like that. And this is sort of helping a bit to, to acknowledge when treatment is bad rather than... Um, and also to acknowledge people's expectations because of their beliefs about Jesus. They believe that they can dump a whole heap of what I'd classify as very hurtful and harmful behaviour on me and because I'm Jesus, I should be able to handle it, is the way they see it, because of their belief systems. Mm. And, and it's almost like, because I'm Jesus, if I am Jesus, I deserve it anyway, is sort of the feeling they have. And, and it's hard for me, I'm still sort of recognising some of the f- feelings people have that I get projected at me uh, in an honest way, you know, mm. like rather than going, well, why do I feel so terrible in this person's company or whatever? Mm. Um, Mm. what's going on there you know before i'd sort of just dismiss it and try hard to please them or try hard to to you know get them to back off by doing something emotionally for them yes Mm -hmm. and we see that this uh this issue surrounding your beliefs about yourself and it is perhaps apt to call it a shameful mm. set of emotions, a feeling of responsibility for things that have that I don't even really know I'm responsible for, but even occurred. <laughs> yeah, yes, yeah. And we we can see that your denial of those emotions has caused you to be an automatic almost in doing some of those things which you just mentioned mm. about your personal. Um, attitude to the treatment of yourself uh, in the company of others has for very long been very automatic. Yes, and, and, and highly, in, uh, like I'm highly tolerant of very bad behaviour towards myself 
that I would not be tolerant of if I was with another person and they were receiving that same behaviour. Yes. Mm. And may we also add, and I'm joined here yeah, yeah, <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah. by others, yeah, yeah. Um, that you, while you are tolerant of that treatment, you are, and this will be difficult to hear perhaps, but you are very intolerant. Of loving treatment. Of loving treatment. Yeah. In fact, there is, it's almost anger within you that we sense about yeah. loving treatment and angry refusal and rejection. To receive it. To receive love. And this, I feel, has a lot to do with this belief about I've done something yes. terribly shameful that, that I've got to punish myself for type of feeling. Yes, and you must, uh, yes, you <laughs> must be careful to not... Uh, this is a double standard of that course, you have yeah. Yeah. With, for yourself. You feel that you must be punished <laughs> and remove yourself from love when, in fact, you encourage others to seek the love. Opposite. Yeah. Yes, yeah, no, uh, I get even in their <laughs> sin. <laughs> so, yeah. um, yes, we, we, there's so much compassion here for well, you about this matter. Yeah, what I'm trying to do at the moment, rather than analyse it too much, because I am aware, intellectually at least, that all of these things are going on, but um, what, rather than trying to analyse it too much, what I'm trying to do is reconnect with this feeling of shame that exists within me, because I sort of see that as the cause of all these things. And, and if I can... If I can it, it sort of feels to me like I am so blocked to the reception of love um, because of this feeling in me that there's something inherently wrong. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I feel quite strongly that unless I release that emotionally, I'm always, you know, you can try to accept the love, but it's never going to be an open-hearted acceptance. No. Because it's just an intellectual exercise. Mm -hmm. It's not something that you're doing emotionally. So, uh, am I, so I'm having to, and, and, and some, in the past, some justifications have been like, even just things like, well, if you guys were all here, you'd probably be treating me the same way. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? So, so when yeah. I receive love from spirit world that I can feel like, oh, yeah, you guys love me. And I also have this underlying feeling of, that if you guys were here, just like all of my other 13 or 12 friends are here, you'd be treating me the same way they're treating me. And, and so, and so it's sort of like a, uh, justification of net, of rejecting the love in that regard, you know, and and also it discounts the love that those those other souls who have returned with you, the love that that is there coming from them in their unified state, also. Of course, yes, yes. and it, and this is uh, and I've talked with uh, yourself before about this sort of state that I'm in of 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 not recognizing our full soul's feelings about things but only feeling the view of it as I have it here on earth as AJ. Mm. And, and we've talked about that a little mm. bit before. And yeah, it is sometimes a bit confusing because sometimes I do have the acknowledgement of the love that people, uh, you know, do give me from the spirit world. And, and I, I don't feel much from people on earth, of course, but, but I do feel some of it, at least from people in the spirit world. But as you say, correctly say, I'm pretty blocked. Uh, because of this underlying real shame, uh, like a deep-seated sense of something, something inherently flawed within me that uh, that I am not letting myself le let go, partly because I, I I'm having a difficulty identifying the feeling of it, um, you know. And again, and uh, uh, <laughs> again, I speak. From a group here, yeah, sure, yeah. Uh, and they we all wish to say it is not by accident that we chose this particular topic for the discussion in order to help you with this shame based feeling. So, if mm. you can uh, reflect upon some of the questions that have been asked and the topic itself, there is an association between this deep sense of shame that you have. It's essentially a shame for now having a less than perfect condition mm -hmm. um, that you currently experience and have experienced for the longest out of any other living being in our universe, mm. um, at least that we are aware of, mm. and we are aware of many, mm. that this, this now being in a, in a state which is 
flawed in, flawed in some ways. And and imp- imperfect, imperfect in love imperfect, and truth yeah. uh, has generated a great deal of shame. And to is, it, is it also possible that it's also related to this feeling of uh, failure about, uh, like, uh, the, the, reason, the reason why I'm asking this question is um, I, I do sometimes have this terrible sense of failure about my life in the sense now, you know, in the sense that all the things that, we, that I discovered in the first century and shared with people now it's so badly distorted that it's actually causing a huge amount of damage to human the human race and and it's almost like this terrible there's, there's associated with it feels sometimes like this terrible sense of failure of like a like of not being able to to uh of getting into a state where you can share the truth only to have all this truth completely distorted to such a point that it's unrecognisable, and and that my that I'm somehow personally responsible for that, because uh, it sort of does feel at times like that, you know. I'm just asking a question. <laughs> yes, yes, there is certainly uh, an element that we can observe t- relating to your sense of impotence as a man in terms of delivering. Achieving your mission, mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. As, as you spoke of just mm-hmm. now, mm-hmm. and uh, certainly we see that mm-hmm. as a part of it, mm-hmm. uh, and and many emotions that we see that you are working very hard to uh, to, for example, now in this period in your life, you're working very hard to achieve this mission. Uh, but then you must take time to to connect to this other feelings you're speaking about because that, as if, mm. as you know, mm. will aid your mission. Mm. Uh, yes. Mm. So yes, mm. this is all a part of it, and it would perhaps require more energy than we can uh, transmit at this time to to give you a complete and fully rounded answer and by that no i don't mean our energy i mean through, through yeah the no, medium. i understand yeah it is very significant what the, the topic that we have raised for, for mm. today and, yeah no i can and, feel that that's the yes, case and, yes yeah and and obviously it must have some connection to the shame that i feel yes because it um it is difficult as you know, it's often difficult, even if somebody does give me some acknowledgement for what I have achieved, it's very, very difficult to receive it anyway. Yes. Um, so, so I do see that there is this, as I've been saying to Mary the last few weeks or months or so, I can see there's something inside of me that's, um, that's got to get, that, that's got, I've got to release. Yes. Uh, otherwise, um, I've got, I'm going to carry this feeling around with me that me that prevents my future growth as a result of it and yes yeah it's a it's a mm. repulsion of some of the best substances that of course <laughs> that of course, you love yeah. so much yeah, yeah. No, i recognize that now you know sort of like, <laughs> yes um, yes we we're very happy yeah yeah, yeah that it's... you're focusing on yeah, yeah, and I'm still a little confused, as, I, as you know, I'm still a little confused about how to connect to it properly. But now that we've had this discussion, it helps me maybe ponder a bit more. Uh, the other thing that I've found very difficult about this subject is because everyone on the planet doesn't, agree, doesn't believe really that I am who, who I claim to be, and um, it's very hard at times for me to process emotions associated with who I am. Uh, because you, you get this terrible level of opposition. And even yes. today during our discussion, we've had so many, you know, op- so much opposition coming from other spirits, yes. uh, Christian spirits and others, preventing us from, you know, at times we've had to stop and, re- re- you know, just, you know, get reconnected to the subject. And, and I can see that all that's also happening um, because this is such an important issue for me yes. to address. Yes. Uh, and if it wasn't such an important issue, they wouldn't be so worried <laughs> about me processing through it. You know what I mean? Yeah. Mm. So that's interesting in itself too, uh, how much opposition there is. And, 
And I can also see it when I'm, you know, when I'm trying to even connect to it, how much opposition there mm-hmm. is at times now yes. where I'm distracted away from the issue or pulled away from the issue through external events yes. or, or whatever. And it's very hard to maintain a constant uh, connection with the issue because there's so many other things trying to, trying to pull me away from the issue. And I can see that as an orchestrated uh, an orchestrated process that these spirits are trying to maintain in order to keep me away from this issue. So, so it, it, those things sort of help me connect a bit more to what the issue's about and, mm. and, and as well. Yeah. Yes. Mm. It's, it's, if you reflect upon you, your time, not just recently, but um, for the past year, this, this issue, um, there's been a, quite a... a a strong effort to prevent you from connecting mm. to this issue, even though you're in quite some pain about the issue and mm. you're very well aware, mm. um, we can see the level of opposition. Mm. Yes. Yeah, I can feel. And even just acknowledging that helps because it sort of feels to me like before I'd even ignore that, you know, or mm. try to ignore that. And um, so many people wish to ignore uh, the acts against them and yeah, the feelings against them. Yeah, yeah. And it's also because a lot of it is happening spiritually rather than physically, although a lot happens physically too. And um, it's it it's also when happening when you're in private, you know, by yourself, and mm-hmm. and so it's also been difficult even when I'm by myself to to work through the issue because it because there's so much opposition to it. And, and I feel I need to probably say here that it's not going to be like that for most people. Mm. Uh, you know, so a lot of people, when they hear me with my personal experience, they get pretty freaked out about what they will have to go through if they go through things. But, uh, you know, I'm now becoming more and more, uh, more aware of how much is focused directly at myself and, and the average person who progresses on the divine love path is not going to sort of experience that level of of uh, opposition to their growth mm. as what I experience mm. because because um, spirits don't see them as uh, as um, the the pivotal uh, momentum I suppose you could call it of change yes. whereas with myself they sort of see myself as this pivotal momentum of change. And if they can crush me, then they can crush the change is the way they see it. So, so it's helping me face some of those emotions more as well. It's helping me to see and, and to probably be helping me be a bit more loving with myself about mm. it because beforehand I would probably be quite self-attacking about it. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> mm. Well. But it's good to have the opportunity to talk to you about it. Yes, yeah. thank you so much, brother, for this opportunity. I'm, mm. It's just me, Stuart, again now. Yeah, yeah. Oh, my brothers and sisters who... Yes. They, well, they wanted to come and lend their uh, love and support yeah. and energy yeah. to yeah. that effort. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. That's and wonderful. And to that. remind you that they are there. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Yes, and that... That really concludes what I wanted to speak right. with you about. Thank you again. I did and get the opportunity, though, to ask you about the Spirit World celebrations. Perhaps we could uh, discuss those. Well, I did speak a little about uh, how they are generated mm. And, mm. and how they are created. And the reality is that um, they vary greatly according to uh, where they are occurring and the condition of people uh, in that location, so they there there are some lovely examples in the books that you referenced, mm-hmm. but there are many more it, multitude of what you would call experiences or physical or spiritual manifestations in the environment of mm-hmm. the celebration. But I suppose um, for me the 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 purity of a celebration comes from this sincere feeling of uh, gratitude or a desire to honour the other. As you know, there's many celebrations that happen when someone hasn't given a gift but they have progressed. Mm. And so, um, mm. a- again, there is a, this, this love causes us to desire 
to to give that gift. Yeah, yeah, I miss them. You know, yeah. I miss the celeb. You know, there's so many. It's, it's when you're there as a spirit, and you ha- you have the privilege of being in the role of of channeling some of that. You know, some of God's feelings through the whole proceedings and seeing the hearts of people. Cha- you know, who are who have changed. Um, demonstrating that change through what happens in their interaction with that um, and then moving to a new location you know just uh, I miss that kind of mm. celebration a lot actually mm. um, and nowadays uh, you know as you know I've always felt very uncomfortable with birthdays and stuff like that as well so I don't actually celebrate my birthday and and partly it's because it just feels so like I don't know, it, it just triggers a lot of sadness uh, yes. re- regarding what a real celebration is compared to, you know, what kind of celebrations we have here on earth, which feel, feel like, you know, you honour the person for one day of their year, but the rest of the time you denigrate them. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> but it is something that, uh, that the group remarked upon, really, that while we understand your distaste for birthdays as such, there is a neglect of celebration within you and within your definitely, life definitely. because of yeah. these emotions. Yeah. There's a, there's a, you, are, you aren't yet good at celebrating, no, <laughs> either of you. <laughs> we're both not good at having fun uh, or celebrating at this stage um, and both, both for the same probably reason. We both carry a significant amount of personal shame and that was something that the group wished to say to you earlier, which mm-hmm. was about the shame that you carry about, um, well, it's difficult now for me to totally <laughs> describe it, but mm. this shame that you carry is within each of those who has returned. But for yourself, it is particularly heightened because of the, t- the things we discussed in this interview, the, yes, the yeah. particular beliefs on earth about yes. yourself. Yeah, mm. yeah. And this yeah. creates the sim- very similar problems for each one of the 14. Yeah. And, uh, yes. So and it's e- good each that one we of the 14 the has a high up. degree of personal shame, don't they? And yes. they act it out in different ways, obviously. Yes. But, uh, but it is relating to this same yeah. issue. It will be, y- your progress through it will assist them greatly. Yeah, no, I understand that. Yeah. No, it's good. It's good to have that com- conversation about it. But just an aside before you go, you feel to me like you've made some changes. Definitely. You want to just say where you are now. <laughs> that must be the next interview. <laughs> that must be, yeah. I think so. Well, I'm, I'm very proud to say that I have um, uh, moved into the eighth sphere. Yeah, and, lovely. Uh, yes. Yeah. And that yeah. is wonderful. Yeah. And, right. and, yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> So, There's so much joy. So, we've got a lot of questions to ask you next time, haven't we, about yes. the process? Because last time we talked to you, you were in the fifth so, oh, and yes. visiting the seventh. Yes. And, uh, and so. I didn't tarry too long in the seventh. No. To be, I to didn't be think honest. you were. <laughs> <laughs> You've wet my desire, or you wet my desire. Yeah. And uh, since then, I've grown it quite a lot. Yeah. And I feel very much. It's a very recent transition that I've made, but uh, it. It is wonderful, and uh, yeah. it's difficult to convey my level of joy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yes. and did your soulmate make a transition at a similar time? Uh, not yet. Not yet, not so yet. not quite yet. No. No, worries. But soon, soon it will ha- we will have a celebration. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That'll, be, that'll be great too, hey? In fact, very soon. Yeah, yeah, it'll be lovely. So, yeah, that'll be interesting. We're going to have to ask you about that. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and and beyond that, it's going to probably be difficult for us to have conversations uh, for a while, Perhaps. Um, probably probably yeah. until such a time as uh, you know. Uh, I suppose a lot of, a lot of it is about the content of the conversations. Mm. It is hard to understand for other people who who will be listening to them. That's my main. Yes. You know, once 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 you get into celestial condition, it's difficult for people to understand that condition unless they are emotionally connected so yes and yeah. uh, language is vastly inadequate yes to describe the blissful feelings yes. yeah yeah that's, thank that's you, wonderful brother. news thank you. good celebration you must have had a good celebration then yes you probably celebrate a lot better than i would now but anyway 
<laughs> yes, very much. And, uh, yeah. We, there is so much love here for you and we yeah, send that you. and yeah. encourage you. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Yeah, I've just got to become aware of it and do something about yeah. the precluding emotion. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. <laughs> okay, <laughs> farewell. Yeah, no worries. Thanks for your time, Stuart.